UASCI Lab to Business Showcase number five with the Oklahoma State Universities and um, research and technology opportunities. Thank you for attending. If you have any questions, always feel free to contact me and find me on the uh, uascluster.com website. Um, and so just to kind of kick us off here, we have um, um, Craig is gonna tell us a little bit more about UASCI and so, Next page there. Sure, thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon or morning, or from wherever you might be coming from. Um, so uh, my name is Craig Mahaney. For those that don't know me, I'm the executive director for the uh, UAS Cluster Initiative. Um, look, I just wanted to chat just a couple minutes, maybe not even two minutes, about what the what the cluster is and why we do this uh, programming. Um, so we are a SBA supported regional innovation cluster. Uh, but we focus on Oklahoma, specifically the UAS and advanced air mobility sector. Um, our real mission is to, uh, is to develop and create an ecosystem where UAS startups uh, can thrive. Uh, we try to help them connect with innovative networks, uh, access uh, global capital, and then uh, discover uh, national technologies, which is why we uh, do this lab to business pitch session. Um, and really, the, that, this session has two goals. One is... Uh, really to connect national and university labs with entrepreneurs that are looking for technologies uh, that are number one, commercially viable, and that uh, could be the backbone of starting a new company. Uh, second, uh, could be a technology that su could support one of their current product lines. So really it's just exposing uh, folks to the many um, really great technologies that labs are creating every day, uh, and not always getting at the exposure they need. So. Um, that's why we do this, uh, especially excited about today's event. Um, we'll get to hear about a couple of different technologies and some important updates from uh, our, our friends who we work with often here at Oklahoma State University. Um, also, just wanted to plug real quick the uh, cluster. Uh, we did just start a brand new podcast. Um, episode two is out, so you can check that out at our website um, and then get access to that podcast. We meet uh, generally with uh, startup founders and uh, and uh, knowledge uh, industry knowledge um, leaders that um, just to talk about kind of what's going on in the industry and uh, and uh, hear the truth rather than the hype, um, which is always valuable for folks. So just wanted to plug that real quick. So with that, I'll uh, pass it back over to Jack. You're muted, Jack. Hi, Jay, I think you're muted. Thanks. I was muting because I wasn't talking. But anyway, uh, thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, so ev for everybody, again, welcome uh, for attending today. Um, OSU has a, a, a program, a great program put together. In a minute, I'll turn it over to, to Victoria, and she's going to guide us through the program. And I thank them for putting all this together. Um, just kind of a reminder, and I'll say it again at the end, there'll be a sur survey that will go out to you uh, um, this afternoon about this. Please answer um, uh, the questions if you can, because that helps us in, with our SBA metrics and things like that. Um, um, as usual as goes on in these things, you can post questions in chat. Um, I'll be um, collecting those, and then at, at some point we may, we, if we have time at the end, we'll also open it up to um, um, the audience to ask the questions directly. Um, but if you're not talking, we do ask that you mute yourself to avoid extraneous noises in there. And um, with that, let's say so for today, Matt, Victoria is going to go through the OSU introduction. Um, Dr. Ben Lowe is going to talk about Atlas and this uh, coaxial motor dual axis gimbal um, um, flight control mechanism. Uh, Amanda is going to talk about Cowboy Innovations and um, Victoria is going to come back and talk about OER and their overall research and technologies and then they'll post some um, Follow up and contact information. If and having said that, I'm going to hand it over to Victoria. Take it over. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, 
So one of the things that I wanted to mention first off, there will be a lot of acronyms. I apologize, it's zero space, and this does uh, an unbelievable amount of acronyms. So I'll be walking you through some of them. So OAIR is Oklahoma Aerospace Institute for Research and Education. That is one of OSU's new initiatives uh, and institutes that is really taking the focus of investing in research from the ground up and doing that in a holistic manner that is going to develop workforce pipelines and uh, be able to get technologies uh, research developed out the door and really build up an entire ecosystem. So um, there are also here USRI, Unmanned Systems Research Institute. Uh, there are a lot of things that have been started by USRI that will continue to OER. I am going to kind of explain that a little more uh, further down the line, but think of them almost interchangeably. OER is just an expansion of scope from USRI. Um, I have a quick video uh, kind of what OSU pretty uh, video so that we can kind of get framed in on what that is um, and then I'll talk again. Oklahoma State University is providing vital solutions for the growing aerospace industry from unmanned aerial vehicles to workforce development, groundbreaking innovations, and impactful research. We are leading and inspiring the next generation of aviators and engineers. Where can you find aerospace innovation? Orange is the answer. So yeah, very nice video, um, inspiring and all of that. What's really great about this is that investment in developing this pipeline further. Um, we're going to really be focusing today on Dr. Ben Lowe and a lot of the technology that he has been able to develop. He is a cornerstone of the innovation that has come out of USRI, and that is going to be uh, some of those key investments and opportunities uh, around OAIR. So we're really happy to have him as part of the team. He's actually joining us from around the world right now. Um, he is one of our only team members who is not in Oklahoma but uh, he still has such an impact no matter where he is. So excited to let him kind of talk about uh, these two technologies. Uh, so Ben, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks Victoria. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I've been with OSU since 2011. So I kind of beat Orange for sure. So uh, I'm sure that there'll be a lot more smarter people and you know researcher in OSU. And thank you for inviting me to talk about two of the technology here. So today I'll be presenting two piece of technologies and then talk about what it is, what does it do, and then uh, hopefully give an idea why this actually got patented and what kind of commercialization path, uh, a little bit about that, um, you know, uh, the benefit from, from um, these uh, patents, okay? So next slide, please. So the first one I'll be talking is Atlas. So in the long form, the name is called All Terrain uh, Land and Air Sphere. So uh, let's, next slide, yeah. So what is Atlas? So Atlas is uh, basically just a flying sphere, okay? But with the integration of ground mobilities, okay? So uh, again, this back in 2009, uh, when I started my PhD and under the mentorship of Dr. Jamie Jacob, which is our director of USRI. Uh, so he, he basically have this class where, hey, let's build something from scratch. Um, and this is what I kind of come up with. And then, uh, so the, the, the Atlas, Basically, it is a round sphere. The sphere actually have multi-purpose. First is to have protect the, the spinning propeller, first of all, from the environment and people. And then, as you can see in this uh, picture here, uh, the, the Atlas have capability to take off vertically, land vertically, like any other drones that you see today. But the, the, the other thing is that since we're dedicated for firefighter, first responder, they may not be the best pilot. So landing could be an issue, right? Especially dealing with the disaster area, you will not have a perfect uh, landing or perfect uh, floor for you to land vertically, right? So Atlas allow it to be rolled to a stop, or you can just, you know, uh, roll to a stop, conserve energy, right? Because, because every time people talk about search and rescue, you're expecting like you look for maybe a victim in the rumble, right? But then if your drones keep on flying and you have a microphone, what are you gonna get? you're gonna get as a propeller sound, right? So with the ability to roll on the ground to a stop, maybe you can conserve your energy, turn your mic, you know, pick up whatever sound or visual uh, intelligence or information. Then you can roll away from the obstacle 
To do upright, uh, basically just reverse the propeller, it will still generate some thrust, uh, as called re reverse thrust. Once you're upright, you can take off again. So basically Atlas, it has a capability to recover, okay? So you can see here on top, there's a uh, different kind of shape and different material. But overall, Atlas have um, propellers, you have control vanes within the sphere for flight control, and then you have a frame for protection, okay? Next one. So uh, even though I kind of briefly talk about what Atlas do, uh, what we're trying to, you know, we talk about uh, value proposition or benefits, right? So what we consider in Atlas is that it considers one of the safer design. Uh, we use carbon fiber exoskeleton to protect the people, properties, and the platform itself, okay? Because Atlas can carry uh, sensors, for example. So, and then ideally, uh, we design this for actually for indoor flight, okay? Unlike any drone you see today, you are relying on GPS, you have to have some, uh, uh, to fly perfectly outdoor. But when it comes to indoor, right, protective frame is definitely one thing, but then what happens if you have a, no GPS? So either you have a damn good pilot skill or you have something like Atlas, right? right? You can have forgiving contact or impact with the environment, and then you can just have to uh, recover and fly again if you have to. So like I said on the third point, right, you can have good landing capability, you can land on any surface, you can roll upright, either to roll away from obstacle or for return to flight, okay? And the last point is really, you might not see here close, but uh, the Atlas frame designed to carry uh, multiple sensors depending on what mission that you're trying to do. We are not doing the Atlas like, oh, we can fit everything at once. Every mission, maybe you only need an infrared camera, maybe you need a microphone only, at least you can put it right on top of the Atlas. So there's some picture here to show that some of the activities that we have done in the past and of course, uh, if we want to, we can train Jedi, right? So <laughs> that is uh, Anthony uh, Lazowski, the Senior Advisor for Military and Foreign Relations of Senator Jam Inhofe. Back in 2015, he come and visit uh, uh, a man Cowboys, our previous company, and we just kind of show off the Atlas. And then we also are the only UA UAS uh, flight to date that actually fly inside the US Senate. It was during the Aerospace uh, Drone Safety Caucus uh, back in about two, 2015 as well. So the lower one was at the 2020 Tinkerfest. I did a lot of um, basically uh, outreach as well. And you can see that one thing I didn't point out is that the Atlas, depend on your payload, depend on your propulsion, is actually can vary in size. So the size that I built uh, is actually ranging from 12 inches diameter all the way to 24 inches diameter. So, but to keep it you know, operational, the, the, the more proper size is about 16 inches. So that is what the uh, the JDI trainer, you can see on the picture that that's about 16 inches, okay? All right, so next one. So obviously we got a pattern like we mentioned, if you are uh, giving the link, actually, uh, if you click on the link later, uh, even though I talk about uh, how we can roll on the ground using the propeller, there is other uh, version uh, of the design where I actually have wheel uh, on the Atlas. So you can take all those details inside the, the link provided by our OSU patent office. So and then uh, we actually received $250,000 for OSU Carbon Technologies between 2014 November to December of 2015 to kind of develop these uh, technologies. Well, having a patented uh, design is one thing, right? Having a good business is a different story. So we can talk about that in a different time. All right, but mainly uh, this is about Atlas. So if there are any questions right now, comments, threats, suggestions, I'm open for it before I talk to the next technology. Uh, oh, sorry, the next video. Yes, video is important. So this is the back of the uh, 2015 AUVSI. So we actually give a national broadcast uh a live demo actually so this is a clip of the video so AUVSI is one of the largest uh, drone show and we are fortunate to uh able to attend it every year i think since 2013. yeah so what it's showing there is this roll out and then and you can see that the there are veins moving parts those are the veins that actually control it so one of the uh, difficult thing is that how can you control the single propeller 
from spinning because single propeller always cause like a reaction torque, right? So the veins under within the, the, the atlas is actually controlling the pitch, roll, and yaw at the same time. So basically, when I was working on this uh, atlas, I had to overcome four major challenges. So the obviously the aerodynamic and control. Okay, how can you make this stable with a single propeller? You can see in the video. Uh, Victoria, you can stop the video if you want to. Uh, and then the the frame. Make sure it's lightweight. It can be uh, uh, su survive the like, impact. Right. Basically, I dropped the atlas like ten feet because ten feet is more like a high ceiling from. For indoors, make sure you can survive. The third thing is how can you ensure good mobilities? So when I combine these three challenges together, obviously the last thing is how to make sure the center of gravity uh, of the sphere can operate effectively in the air and ground. The reason is that when, let's say, imagine this, if the center of gravity is at the very bottom of the sphere, what is going to happen is that when you land on the ground, you definitely can go upright. Right, because it's, it's very balanced. But then when it flight, it had a horrible flight characteristics. So, and then if if the again, if the center of gravity is too low, I was having a hard time rolling on the ground, right? Because it was trying to self-balance it. So there are some of the uh, consideration or challenges that I have to face when I designed all these four components together: aerodynamics, the frame, the ground mobilities, and then you know, just the CG. Okay. So yeah, this this actually my PhD work uh, from 2011 actually. That's how when I started, and then uh, we come to this uh, pattern in 2015. So that's video kind of conclude these technologies, and now open up for any question for now, or we can come back later if you have any more questions. Um, any questions? I don't see any in the chat. Um... On the, let me ask one question on the sensor and, and uh, for the sensors and your your uh, payload type packages, is there kind of a, a um, you have kind of a package envelope, how much they weigh, how much space or anything like that? Or, or is that kind of just dependent on how large you scale the overall Atlas? Uh, I guess if I was correct, yes. Uh, depending, at that time when I developed this Atlas, you know, Today, we kind of got, quote unquote, spoiled a little bit because we got so many options of controller boards, uh, all the pilots, right? Back then, I really have only like one autopilot, you know, back then it was so expensive. So that's in terms of autopilot, uh, I, I need to make sure that th there was autopilot that actually make things work. Actually, there was none back then. And then, of course, in terms of, you know, the payload, uh, what is the volume within? Those are really the, the really one of the headache too, because if it's too small, I may not have enough control surface, or if it's too big, right, then it will affect other stuff as well. But yes, that is depending on what kind of uh, mission, I would say, because if you have a sensor on top, if, if it's too heavy, right, then now I have a center of gravity too high, and then you will always kind of roll, roll you yep. know. Yeah, so though, yes, yes, definitely have some design criteria first, uh, or mission criteria before I can tell you, hey, is uh, 12 okay. inch better or 24 inch better? Because I'm not going to go bigger than 24. It's the reason if I focus on first and rescue, right? As you can see this uh, picture here from the video, right? You don't want to go bigger than the door. Sure. Right? But also, you don't want to be too bigger than the window, right? So, if of course, if the window is, is closed, then you find a way to, to press the glass. There's a different story, right? Yeah. So, yes, there is uh, requirements uh, depending on the mission. So it's kind of it's very much kind of like an airplane and keeping your you know your weights and and balance all set correctly. Yeah, the balance, uh, the CG. When I say CG, it doesn't shift anything. Like the airplane, like you said, exactly. Uh, CG. Yeah. Hold on just a second. Somebody, somebody needs to mute here. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, yes, you still like an airplane, right? Or to make sure they have a, a center of gravity that works. So that's why yeah. in my case that the center of gravity is not changing, just to make sure that there's a kind of delicate balance between operating in the air and the ground. Okay, yes, there's a CG exist. Okay, and one more question. I'm not seeing anything, but I'll, anybody can uh, speak up here. But so what is your communication link? Um, I mean, what, um, 
what is the, does it work on, you know, uh, wireless or is it use other type of communication? Pretty much like any other drone today, they're using like the 2.4 gigs uh, for the radio controller, but the, and then the video as well. But video is a bit tricky because uh, you have to penetrate the, the signal to the wall, right? So higher frequency may not work. So we have to do something like a 1.2 uh, just to make sure we get some video, okay? But of course, we're also talking about uh, have to use uh, radio, kind of like the kind of like those uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi extender. Right, because after a few walls, you might lose the signal. So there's some some additional kind of like booster required when you're operating in an unknown environment. So yeah, this radio 2.4, 2. Yeah, two, yeah, X uh, radio controller. Okay. Um, open up the audience uh, questions. Oh, uh, this is Phil Ben. If uh, and this might. Um, overlap on what you're talking about next, I'm not sure. But just curious if you were a PhD student today and you saw Atlas and you wanted to go to the go to the next step, what would you be thinking about? Uh, actually, uh, different kind of uh, propulsion uh, control. I think like I said, we might overlap the next one, right? So even though we are, we are not presenting the whole technologies, there are more, I wouldn't say simpler way, but uh, as our drone technologies, you know, getting more accessible, right? Like racing drone technology is getting more popular, right? I'm actually be able to test not a single propellers. I can even use coaxial uh, propellers. I can even use wherever the technology I'll be presenting next to actually fit into Atlas. So without using any control surface. So make things more simple. So those are the stuff that I can, uh, if I, let's say a new PhD comes in, those are the stuff that they can improve, right? Propulsion, how can you save battery or how can you make the frame lightweight and strong, right? Because the more every ounce that you save, that helps on your endurance. So energy density. So those are the stuff that all can contribute to make Atlas better um, improve basically, okay? And I'm not gonna stop talking about AI stuff. Those are different, you know, realm of uh, research okay. right. yeah so sure we can uh as long as you can fit into that three inch or two inch tube within the atlas that uh, you can pretty pretty much uh improve uh, atlas in 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 the control side of things for example okay thank you yeah. one last question for me it just popped in do you, do you ever or you ever looked at like like you were talking about imaging or whatever is uh, multiple of these collaborating? Uh, yes, actually, uh, in, we actually submitted a proposal in the past uh, as one of, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you all familiar with the Prometheus, the movie, but you had through a sphere and then kind of discovered the, the, the uh, how to map the, uh, the cave. So yeah. kind of similar concept, right? Whether it all has to be Atlas, sure, it can be actually a good uh, research topic, to be honest. But we actually propose uh, some kind of collaborative effort between different platforms. So if, can you imagine like, uh, you know, drones typically have limitations in, in terms of the flight time, right? Batteries and so on. So we actually propose something like we have a kind of like a small uh, ground vehicle that actually kind of like R2-D2 on X-Wing, right? So you have Atlas on top of the ground vehicle and then you go explore the cave, right? And if you see something that maybe you can't see from your ground vehicle cameras, maybe it's a high ceiling cave or something, then you deploy the Atlas. So those are kind of collaborative, uh, you know, such and rescue um, proposal, I guess, uh, using different kind of platform. Yeah, Atlas, you know, if you want to depend on sensor, you can maybe just depend on your flight time and your power consumption. Maybe you can use Atlas to kind of like uh, map certain part of the area. You come back there to that, uh, ground vehicle basically. And then either you recharge or send another one, uh, Atlas out for mapping, for example. Yeah, so so there definitely have a lot of, uh, you know, different application in terms of, you know, mapping, search and rescue, uh, working to map on, you know, GPS deny environment, for example. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this is the next one. Uh, 
So we have no specific name for this. This is uh, basically uh, different control methods. Uh, this is simple core gimbal mount and coaxial uh, helicopter. Uh, the reason, uh, next slide, please. So I think you're all very familiar with the Mars helicopter, right, by NASA. And uh, what I put it on the top right corner is basically the, uh, the, the we call it a variable pitch of cyclic control of the Mars helicopter. So basically what it happened is that uh, the both propeller is spinning clockwise, kind of clockwise at a certain RPM and to change the, you know, control uh, in flight, there's a change of the, the blade angle, right? So those are cyclic control. So when we actually developed this, it's just an alternative method, you know, to control something like a Mars helicopters. So what basically, I'm not sure whether you can see in the picture, um, this is basically a, a gimbal for controlling both row and pitch axis. And then the, the two motors, uh, unlike the NASA version, is basically changing the RPM for either one of the, the, the motor speed, and then you can control the yaw, right? So that's basically uh, what happened. So when I developed this, uh, is, this is not like, you know, another long research. This uh, whole concept, this prototype, it only took me a week to do it from a conceptual phase to, pro to actually flying this. So you'll be seeing a video later. So that was the first flight, okay? So when we were fortunate that uh, when I fly this, uh, there was actual uh, NASA engineer that worked on the actual Mars helicopter and kind of like witnessed the first maiden flight, okay? That's the video you guys are gonna see soon. So the why we patented this, because uh, during the uh, 2021 AUVSI, we actually got contact by some uh, company in Texas uh, who showed interest, uh, sorry, uh, the company in Texas, they're actually focusing on selling a STEM kit, right, uh, for, to school and university. So obviously they can't buy actual NASA helicopters, right? So when they saw this, they said, hey, we would like to potentially make this as a STEM demonstrator, right? And again, don't get confused. We're not building this for future Mars helicopter, right? You know, this is kind of the Earth version. So the STEM company is interested to turn into a STEM demonstrator for the teacher, for for kids to get excited about, you know, the Mars helicopter and so on, okay? So the next slides, uh, yeah, this is more like a show off. Again, this is the, the link to the detail of my pattern. Uh, we actually uh, take picture with the, with the actual team that developed the uh, NASA helicopters. And obviously you can see my size is much bigger than what they have. Yeah, so that's the chief engineer working in the air environment. Uh, that I met during the 2021 AUVSI. Okay, so, and then next one, the next slide, please. So this is actually the maiden flight uh, in back in July, 2021. We are not like a 90 second hop. So uh, actually have a full control of left and right, uh, yaw, and then obviously a good safe landing. Yeah, one of the, the things is that to make sure the, again, I had to program the uh, flight controller to do all this. So there's not like off the shelf um, controller that you can do whatever I want to do. So, and then the motor uh, actually is, uh, I have a custom made uh, from two separate motor and make it a coaxial motors to make this uh, uh, mass hel oh, helicopter works. The propeller that you're seeing in the video actually is uh, 40 inches diameter. Uh, and then I operated with the uh, 5S battery and so on. So I just give you a sense of like what kind of power or batteries and the size of the uh, the gimbal mount and coaxial helicopter looks like. Okay. Yeah. So that's all I have for in terms of the the helicopter side of things. But yeah. So so as well, imagine that you know if I string this down, which I did. Uh, and apply the same gimbal control on the Atlas. So I pretty much really just learned from what I built for Atlas, I just supersize the gimbal and actually make this uh, helicopter works. Hey Ben, how does the, what's the power consumption look like on that type of gimbal helicopter as opposed to like a normal drone? Uh, you know what, I, I did not record that because my, my board doesn't record any data out of it. 
So I'm saying like the, uh, I don't know if I can see the detail there. I need to kind of bring back the motor size because those motors off the shelf. Um, I forgot how many KV was that. It's a very low KV, it's from T motor. So I, I can actually ping you the, the detail too, if you're interested. Yeah, so because I, I wasn't very too much power consumption, focusing on the on the control. And then, uh, like I said, this whole thing took me just a week. And we just like, okay, I did in the cat, make it happen, if you do, and then we just move on. <laughs> so so yeah, I, I, you can ping me, uh, I can give you more detail of the motor, then you can maybe uh, get the, your answer, the answer you're looking for. All right, thanks. I do okay. just want to add in here that there are an amazing amount of things that have shown up over a weekend uh, that Ben has been just working on randomly uh, in the lab that will just come back in and he's got a totally new design uh, for something just popping up. Yeah, that's the fun with the USRI. So, you know, of course, we want to make sure we get our job done first. And then uh, uh, Dr. Jacob will come in and say, hey, Ben, can you build this? So at least we got a freedom to do something and ended up it will pass on maybe as a research topic for some students. And then we just kind of, uh, you know, develop in-house. And then uh, like this Mars helicopter, we're kind of fortunate that we are approached by company that who, who are interested to buy the, the patent, or uh, IP, sorry. So that's why we had to kind of rush into the patent um, application with the OSU patent office. So or else, you know, this is just another fun projects that we develop in the USRI. How much additional payload do you project to haul with it? Oh, again, the, this one, we can actually put like two GoPro. We're talking about like 500 grams. Mm. But again, depending on, you know, how much flight time you want to achieve. And 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 pretty much we can, I can fly for like, the last I calculated, maybe like 20, 20 to 25 minutes. Mm. Yeah, we right. put a one GoPro on top, on top of it. So that, that is something that, you know, we, again, we, we, I'm not planning to optimize the flight time, but really to test, make sure that the, the coaxial motor that I developed works and then with the control uh, system, and then we can fly. So. Yeah, even though I think, I think the way I make it sounds like, you know, we not really, uh, how to say w one thing about uh, some of the things I do is not about oh we are going to do this and write paper but it's more like you know once I develop this uh, kind of like a kickstarter right I develop this uh, baseline uh, demonstrator and then we kind of pass on to the student and let them expand the idea and then you know hey do more the, on the engineering work and, and make sure that hey why this works uh, uh, how to control this maybe draw some equation and blah 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 so those are kind of like my role, I always say an official role for me to kind of like a Kickstarter for a technology demonstrator in USRI. So yeah, hopefully, uh, of course, there are a lot more technology that we develop. We actually turn the papers, we present an AI AAA. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, that, that is not brought up today, okay? Usually Ben just hands it off to my office and then we take it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. I feel like that's also a good transition for this. Oh yeah, I guess so. <laughs> if anyone had any more questions, speak up now. Okay. So we're, real quick, I got a, one quick question for you, Ben. So, and and I'm not sure, I'm trying to see if this makes sense because I know other folks do this. If you put it, if you use this system, with two of them on a wing design, could it account for the controls, other control surfaces that you normally put in that introduce drag, drag like um, elevons or ailerons or anything like that? Because it it seems like you might be able to 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 do that, um, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I can I can tell you that uh, uh, yes. Uh, of course, depending on, you know, let's say we're just talking about UA, UAS scale, right? Yeah. I think at the end of the day, it's depending on how powerful is your uh, autopilot or how many output that you can support uh, sure. for your, you know, control surface motor, right? So I can, I can, you know, if you look at all those flying cars today with the wing and um, 
for example, I've, I don't have that name in my head, but some of those uh, propellers that embedded inside the, you know, the wing thickness, right? Yeah. You can use control rotating propellers. Yeah, it's the same thing. I can I can uh, build it in a UA, UAS scale. All thanks to today's where we have all varieties of racing drone uh, controller boards. As long as you can eight or ten or twelve uh, output, um, building that is, is uh, for me okay. Uh, definitely is easy and fun. Yeah, so it's, it's again, it's all depending on whether you have output. Because, for example, you know, when we go back to Atlas, when I first developed Atlas, right, I talked to you guys about like having eight control surface. And back then, you know, uh, I need uh, nine. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not like a programmer or, or good at electronics back then to build my own board. I can only get eight. So, you know, what can I do? So basically, I can only use eight output to control a uh, control surface and then the throttle somehow just have to control directly from the radio uh, i mean radio means that you know the futaba they have the radio so i had to bypass the autopilot system and just have a control manually from the uh, radio controller so those are some of the stuff that you have to kind of play with but again you know depending on your power consumption how many output that you can control for me i think is pos possible so you don't have to, it's not like, you know, uh, okay, you have to limit yourself to eight motors or stuff. You can do 16 motors if you want to. <laughs> okay. And no more yeah. questions from the audience, right? Go, Amanda. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Well, today I'm just going to provide a really brief introduction to Cowboy Innovations. We take um, wonderful researchers like Ben and all of the OERS team, but all of, all of OSU, and try to bring it to industry. So next slide. The um, Cowboy Innovations basically is your concierge to the opportunities at Oklahoma State University. You can bring us your needs. Uh, and we will delve into the many facets of Oklahoma State, whether it's OERS and the MECI team or physics or chemistry or ag, and bring you a menu of options to meet those needs and a menu of researchers and talent that we can work from. Go ahead, next slide. Our team has many facets in itself, but we focus on Office of Technology, which is my office, but also we have small business adventures that can test and bring technologies up to a certain point before they're incorporated into a roadmap at your level. But we also do industry engagements to bring back to ideas, concerns, and needs to the university in a non-disclosed way that you would have agreement with me. And then I can take the generalities and talk to the right individuals and provide you with feedback and the decision of whether further NDAs and uh, applications and also projects can be brought into the system. We also have a very large research park that we're populating and have great plans for that. Next one. In Oklahoma State, we have over $187 million in annual research, which adds virtual dollars to your R&D budget. With the experts in every discipline and facilities to match, we uh, have everything that any that anyone can ask for in their R&D development process, including uh, app development and a high performance computing center. We are growing tomorrow's workforce to bring basically an additional way to advance your R&D program through facilities and even capstone and foundation support. And we actually have three different ways to do that. One of them is the sponsored research agreement, the researcher services agreements, capstones. Basically, the service agreement is you give us a box of Legos with instructions, and we have the tools and expertise to do it quickly, efficiently, and to your standards. But with your instructions, it's not a lot of innovation. However, the, spon the sponsored research agreements is like handing us a pile of Legos and giving us a goal. We will produce the results that you need with the parameters that you set. And then finally, we have our capstone projects, which is really important for uh, resources in workforce development. You bring the opportunities to these younger students and that will advance your R&D process, but maybe at a slower rate so that when you are done with that type of uh, program, you'll actually have not only a solution in hand, 
but individuals that are aware of your brand, aware of your company, and probably already enabled inside of your system to easily integrate as employees. So that lays a really quick overview of what Oklahoma or Cowboy Innovations does. Um, next slide. This is my team, myself. I have the engineering uh, background, Jay Hari. He is our um, software and industrial engineering, our chemistry and bio individual is Russ Hopper. And then we have our small business startups that can help with the trickier pieces of intellectual property and bringing them to a TRL of your need and level. But between the five of us, we can meet the needs and bring you into Oklahoma State University. Any other questions on what I do? I know that was really fast, but I found that Ben's work is basically the best part of this presentation. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, but I would like to add, now you have a picture here. I've been uh, so fortunate to work with Russell, Daniel, Will, Jay, you know, Amanda, she's recently joined too. But uh, when when I was uh, supported uh, by Cowboy Tech, when they invested uh, in my company, Cowboy Technologies, sorry, I'm a man cowboy. It's got so many cowboys here. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we got so many advice and, and help uh, constantly. And then... Um, uh, basically, you know, even though we're not running a man cowboys uh, anymore, but working with OSU and uh, USRI, you know, I, I see a lot of the the students right now that you know affected by all this entrepreneurial world, you know, start their own startup and so on. So I was fortunate to be able to kind of use my experience and kind of help them. And of course, uh, I, I think that you know OSU in terms of. Uh, promoting a technologies or research, right? I even got help from, uh, I don't know whether I always used to have that, the technology business development program. Uh, you know, that was before we got a seed fund. So I, at that time I got like $30,000 uh, just to kind of help on my uh, graduate research to kind of develop uh, Atlas to a certain level. And then I actually met with the cowboy technologies that I turned they give me the seed fund to, you know, for my startup. So yeah, I, I think that you know, uh, with uh, all this program, with the OSU patents, um, all this ent entrepreneurial and with the drone technology today, we are fortunate that you know we can actually turn all the research. I mean, not all, but majority of research into something interesting, right? Students, student can come here not just like studies, get a project done and go, but if if you if a professor have an idea, and the student might have a chance to turn it into a business opportunities. Right, and then the, the professor can be the advisor, and then uh, uh, folks from the cowboy innovation can be the advisor, and so on. They will, they will bring in the proper investment when time is right. So yeah, I, I got all those experiments, uh, experience the last few years when I'm working um, um, with all these people. Okay, that's gonna add that to the today. We're lucky to have Ben's technologies that are. A lot, you know, much higher TRL than sometimes what you're used to seeing. But in any case, any ideas and from industries that you have that you just, you know, are just below the line, that's where we can really help bringing virtual manpower and dollars to your R&D budget is how we beat our land grant mission here at Oklahoma State University to exper experience more innovation through uh, collaboration. Oh, Amanda, this Jack, uh, real qu I wanted to also chime in something we, we've we said in these um, showcases over and over and over again, building a research relationship between your engineering teams, if you're doing product development and, and these researchers, the smart guys at the universities here for development, le leverages that kind of as an ongoing thing and is a, a very, very powerful um, uh, approach to to maintain because it's not just you know a, a, sometimes it's not just a tr one time transaction it's maintaining you know the relationship and the cognizance so you can go back to the researchers and say hey this is the kind of latest that's coming along here you guys you know want to work through there so you can because because building these products and product lines um, is an ongoing always competitive thing right so there's always changes and challenges so um building that relationship is a is a good way to keep um in, in front of that 
And I guess no other questions. Oh, no, wait a minute. Does like Cowboy that. Technologies tap expertise throughout or only a small group? So what we do, um, Cowboy Technologies is the startup team. Uh, Cowboy Innovations is the larger team. Anyway, all five of us, what we would do, for example, I've had a large energy company come to us saying we have some needs. They gave us a general idea of what areas they were thinking about, and we set up a campus visit. We can do it virtually, but really being in there and seeing the labs is very helpful. And what we did is took them to a few related labs and then had a round table where we really presented to a few of the faculty talent and leadership what their needs are. And then we spent the rest of that hour just kind of bouncing back and forth uh, ideas, getting an idea of where, what ideas hit and what ideas miss. About three weeks later, we took all of those information and we accept over 28 quad charts of possible projects, innovations, and solutions, and, you know, workforce development, campus integration, all of that into a proposal and presented that to the company that they could send directly to their VPs and decide this area or this group of technologies is what we want to proceed with. And that led into a, uh, a working relationship. So um, we've done that also with uh, aerospace, with Textron, we've done with that and a few others that are in progress right now that I cannot talk about. But that type of system is just one of the many ways that we integrate. But when you come to us, I, that slide with all the bubbles, it just reminds me so much of a net, neural network where there's so many different areas and nooks and crannies that Oklahoma State asking industry to find out who they need to work with is is very difficult. So that is what born uh, Cowboy Innovations is that we are your gateway. You hand us the instructions and we will find the people, no matter if they're in political science or engineering or ag or um, environmental. These individuals know us, they speak to us about their innovations, and so we know where the, the strengths lie. And so we do work as a small group so that you have a one-on-one -on -one contact with us, but essentially through us, you're touching the entire university. And there's one more question here. You have um... examples of your portfolio. Yeah. Um, okay. So all of our portfolio, um, can you go backwards to, uh, to, um, Ben's slides where he said, there's the link to my materials, just because the first part of that, that slide. There. Oh, yeah, that didn't actually show it. Okay, so at cowboyinnovations.okstate.edu, there is technology um, listing. And in that area, you can get in and look at everything that we offer. And if I had my spreadsheet, I'll I'll find it and put it in the chat so you can have it. And but we have so many, like over two hundred different uh, technologies to choose from. In the I've got three um, D printing and advanced advanced manufacturing. We have uh, a, that has two printer heads and they're working simultaneously. Not only does that speed up printing, but it also will provide different material properties that you just don't get from a single head printer. Then we have, let's see, I'm trying to think what would be most applicable. We have some work with rocket propulsion and hybrid rocket systems such that you can, you know, control the burn of a, uh, as a launch vehicle. Uh, especially, especially with the flat wings, that seems to be very helpful. It controls those G-forces, and that is out of our um, ME department. We have many different areas where we are working with nanoparticles. If you need strength or uh, conductivity or heat control, they are able to actually design on the fly nanoparticles to your specifications. We're actually just looking for specifications that need to be met. Uh, we have a method and not necessarily uh, a known product that we want to build. So it's it's quite the, you know, we kind of compare it to the replicator on the enterprise, you know, ask for this and we can build it. So that is something they're working on now. Um, we also have a lot of work with um, swarms, although we have to be careful with that work because it does have some EAR and ITAR issues. 
but that is also available um, for for review. Gosh, I mean, I could spend the rest of our time. <laughs> yeah, Amanda, I think <laughs> I, 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 to, I think I'll bring up these two companies that uh, obviously Cowboy Innovation has been there in the first place, MaxQ, right? Uh, insulation box for blood transport, and then uh, Plasma Bionics, always coming out from the OSU right. engineering departments and students of uh, Dr. Jamie Jacob too. So those are a very successful startup that have been, I think, almost eight or nine years now, I guess, right? So yeah, MaxQ and Plasma Bionic, it's all coming up from Stillwater. So those are two right. great uh, startups that supported from the beginning uh, by OSU and Cowboy Innovation. Uh, right. There's several the startups here. that we've had, um, but yeah. a lot of them are like, there's a, um, oh gosh, now it's long group. There's my fights working on as well, but I don't know that they're really aerospace, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, that's not aerospace. That's why I'm, I'm I'm thinking that's going to add on to your your you know pro, uh, portfolio, I guess. Right. Um, we have roll to roll technologies. That's another yes. work. The Weaver Labs is very helpful in that respect. So yes, we have several startups with the with Daniel and John focusing on that. And let's see, I'll just put, they, the Tech Boy, Cowboy Technologies did a name change, but I think they're moving back to, um, from, uh, what you call it, not, not bright, they used to be Cowboy Technologies and moved to Brightest Orange Ventures, and now it's moving back with a new leadership. So um, I apologize if there's some oddities in what you're about to see here, but that, I'll put that uh, small business startup um, available in the chat as well. Any other questions about what Cowboy Innovations can do for anyone or our reach or limitations? And if anybody wants more information on Atlas or the, uh, the gimbal, let us know with that as well. Or if you want to see Ben build something, let us know that. We can. Yeah, <laughs> we'll I, I, I have no YouTube channel, so just don't put your hopes high, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, I feel like I'm mostly going to echo uh, what everyone else has been saying. Uh, I don't think I need to super underline the magic that happens when you have uh, academia and commercial entities coming together. Um, and one of our newest uh, pieces for OSU is OER is an answer to some of that, um, filling in the gaps there. So the mission for OER uh, to be a global leader in emerging aerospace technologies and particularly championing research, scholarship, and service. And speaking to the land-grant mission of OSU, um, we want to make sure that we are able to bridge that gap even further between uh, having students work on projects and also the deep reach of uh, knowledge that comes with the faculty. But we also employ um, engineers full-time. Uh, there can be a full career that happens at OER. Um, and uh, we will be able to be kind of competitive with industry in that aspect. So you can really get a well-trained, cross-trained, diverse group uh, that has a lot of deep knowledge that can kind of come in and out of industry and work on some very unique projects um, through this kind of effort. So uh, to highlight the areas of competency that OER um, will have, uh, this kind of takes in not only the autonomous systems research that USRI has championed, but also brings in propulsion, again, autonomous systems, the sustainment side of manned and unmanned aerospace. Advanced air mobility, really huge, especially with our launch pad research center uh, being set up over in Tulsa, combined with the test range uh, that Craig is working on with us, um, also in conjunction with uh, OCH LLC uh, and TIL. Um, and also the policy and regulation. Uh, we really understand that it takes strong stewards to move the industry forward holistically uh, and really raise that water level for all the ships involved uh, in the industry. And so we want to be at that intersection as well uh, with the kind of deep research and knowledge that we offer at OSU. And again, that service piece really just speaks to workforce development, a lot of training uh, pipelines um, and bringing this entire ecosystem together uh, to really create 
uh, a lot of innovation that's going to be uh, happening around what's quite frankly uh, aerospace's new golden age with autonomous technology. Um, so in addition to that, just mentioning Counter UAS Center of Excellence, that is also a center that will be housed under OAIR, and that's focused on not just developing uh, the UAS technologies or drones, uh, but also how we are countering them, what those systems look like, what those, again, ecosystems look like, um, and what this entire industry will look like for defense and for uh, commercial endeavors in the future. So I have a video that will have no sound and is just, uh, it's actually something from USRI. So again, starting with that really deep legacy um, that USRI and other uh, amazing professors and faculty across uh, MAE and across the university have started to build our expertise at OSU is very deep uh, when it comes to aerospace. And so I'll just let this play, but if there are any questions for any of us or you know me in particular, uh, this will be a great time, uh, but otherwise feel free to watch said video. Oh, wow, the balloon. Yeah. <laughs> the, first, the first balloon of you. This is one of the things that we also realized is we weren't just doing what people think yeah. of with unmanned system technology. And so this has been really encompassing a lot of the other pieces that we've been working on. And that's our airfield over in Stillwater. That's what we should mention is, let's see, April 28th and 29th are the um, OSU yes. Senior Design, Air Pulse Propulsion, yes. and Speed Fest. Here in Stillwater, we invite everyone to come. It's a free event. Um, if you, I, I saw my uh, LinkedIn, I've posted it several times, so let me know if you want more information or look me up. But it is a great opportunity to see what they're doing in all of aerospace and also the other engineering for our talent that we have around the way. I will see if I can find. Sure. I got Speed Fest, which I'm pretty sure is the most um, interesting for this group, but I will put in as much information as I can. The, the brochure for the, in, the engineering, which is happening on Friday, uh, the engineering design and the air propulsion and pro what is it? There's another P. Aeronautic or aerospace propulsion and power. Um, that's uh, Kurt's material. Um, that is uh, all happening on Friday and Saturday is Speed Fest. So let me get that. There it is. I will put that in the chat. Oops. To everyone. And then let's see. I don't know if the chat will let me do this, but I'm going to give it a shot. So I'm also going to draw attention to this boat here, which is something that USRI has worked on. It is really uh, multidimensional what this technology can affect. And so we have a lot of applications that are not necessarily flying, um, but it's a resultant technology of aerospace uh, and some of the work that we've done before. So just to kind of add on to what Amanda was talking about with the diversity of going across the university, there is a lot that can still be housed with the expertise that is built around aerospace. Yeah, I guess i add on top of to you then. We also, uh, my background actually on the inflatable structure too. So with Dr. Jamie Jacob, we have been developing like deployable mass aircraft wings using inflatable structures. We actually mix a, a deployable space habitat with NASA called the uh, X-Hat Challenge. Mm -hmm. So we also help uh, Toyota to build like a kite to reach uh, 16,000 feet as an energy harvesting kite using inflatable structures. So, and then um, pretty much we did a lot of inflatable structures for all the planets actually, including Pluto, which is not a planet anymore. Uh, we call it like a, basically a, a decelerator uh, to explore the Pluto, uh, tit the moon, Titans, um, all using inflatable structures, aircraft. Uh, balloons, uh, Venus uh, using balloons as well. So yeah, it's not just drones or boats, uh, but pretty much, uh, yeah, space, earth, the land and sea, right? So those are, we are fortunate with the USR where you can do with all the system projects. Yeah. I see we have a question. 
Um, how many businesses in Oklahoma use or want to use drones? I mean, Ooh, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Uh, there yeah. are so many applications for this type of technology. Um, I have no idea what the number is. I just know it would be very high if anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Like shows. Have you guys seen the drone like shows? The, the synchronized uh, drones, right? Those those are drones, you know? So yeah, there's a lot. Uh, Oklahoma is not just a small town, you know, but we have big technologies and, and drone technologies. People thought that we are new. No, we have been... Uh, uh, doing a lot of drone stuff uh, for the last, as as far as I remember, when I joined OSU in 2001. Yeah. 20, 20 or 20 plus. 20 years, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's not just businesses either, like for um, emergency services or other entities, um, using this type of technology can be a real game changer. Sorry, Amanda, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, um, I was just saying that You'd be surprised how many times I enter in with a company and ask them if they've thought about unmanned systems to help. And they're like, I didn't even realize we could. You get into lawn maintenance, agriculture, food production, uh, as well as just maintaining soil compositions. Um, just be anytime that you have surveillance, weather concerns, anything that moves, you're very likely to be able to touch upon an unmanned system in some way, shape, or form. And OAIRS each and re even reaches beyond just the unmanned systems that, um, you know, propulsion, uh, payloads. Payloads are huge. That is where the key is. So even though a company may not be very focused on UAVs, their use and utilization of it is just being tapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I do want to mention this distinction too. Uh, everything that we talk about USRI, you know, we actually just integrating, like Amanda said, a payload to an existing platform, right? Mine is in a very uh, weird situation, but actually I build something from scratch, right? But most of the industry people out there, they're integrating a system to another system, okay? So I think that, uh, uh, you know, if you guys have any new ideas to develop, come to us, right? But then if you think that you can, you have a problem with integration, oh, I have this $40,000 I want to put into a $1,000 drone. Yeah, it's a big problem, right? Maybe we advise you not to do that. So because I think that we have so many people want to do drone uh, application that they sometimes don't realize that drone may not be the best solution. They want to do it because they think it's cool, okay? But <laughs> that, this is how dense or how demanding, you know, this market today that, oh, everything's fly is good. No, not necessary. You know, if you want to operate one hour, but you only have a 10 minute drones, that doesn't make sense. Okay. So that is how drones is popular, uh, at least from our perspective. Yeah. So yeah, the data that you want to look for, how many people actually use drones in Oklahoma or in general is crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be a lot. And with the ability to make drones idiot proof and speaking as probably one of the first idiots i cannot fly these suckers i will crash it every time ben has seen it happen <laughs> just being able to say go and and be able to control a uav in a way that is you know mario kart which i also crash in but make it simple inputs for users to be able to get an output that also will probably keep you within the, the restrictions and security limitations that we have with our policies that we're also helping with Jamie Jacobs, you know, speaking to what was it, Congress or yes, was, Congress. Uh, Congress, yeah, just last week. Um, we are the ones in, we have the ear of national and statewide officials about how and when and the best ways to make the most out of innovation of the uh, OERs and, and unmanned systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we a lot of people don't know that, uh, and that, I remember one point that there's some senator group, the 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 senate people come by, they actually didn't know that we have a good aerospace program, and they kind of uh, coined us as the MIT of aerospace. Mm -hmm. So we are we are actually that good. I mean, not to not because I'm with OSU, but we are. <laughs> we have that uh, good uh, reputation uh, in terms of drones and unmanned systems. Okay, yeah, MIT of aerospace. Think about that. I was like, yeah. I don't know, but is it insult or is it a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Well, and to just bring it full circle, this is why having entities like the, the cluster is so important with 
shepherding forward how these technologies are combined and used. And so we're just really happy to be a part of this ecosystem. And Victoria and Ben, if you guys could, you know, post in the chat what your LinkedIn profiles, they could probably get it from mine, but seeing what you are doing day to day, not day to day, you're not that crazy into, into <laughs> LinkedIn, no. but well, when big events come, knowing and following us will definitely bring you to the forefront of what Oklahoma State is doing. Um, and if, you know, with me, I, I touch on everything. Last week was all advanced manufacturing. Next week, I'm hitting into boiling systems. So you can get a lot from our LinkedIn profiles. Yeah, I don't normally check my LinkedIn, uh, but then, you know, <laughs> updated, but <laughs> hey. Best, posting, that's best okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, we can post those also in the, in the after event um links and information on the website that we'll send out to everybody so with the charts and everything else we usually post the contact information but the linkedin um information we can also include perfect i'll do that that way because i can't figure out how to link it <laughs> that'll alleviate that problem okay and if anybody wants, um, you know, between OERs to come and talk to you or Cowboy Innovations to reach out to you, just let us know. Uh, we can give you more information, more personalized information, so you're not, you know, displaying your technologies and needs to everyone in the group. <laughs> but we are ready and available to, to answer those questions and provide our services. Great. And... Um... Ben, Amanda, Victoria, thank you so much. This has been very good, very educational and insightful on what's going on in, in Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and um, and to see the cutting edge research that you guys are um, working through. So that is just um, really super. To, this has been great to hear about. So thank you for putting on this presentation. Um, Let's see. So, and thank everybody else for attending here. Um, we are we plan to put these about the the third Wednesday of every other month. So, expect to see one in June. Um, kind of tentatively, we actually are looking at kind of advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing type things. So, I may come back and talk to you, Amanda. Um, <laughs> you should. Um, Let's see. So, um, also for th those of you attending, you'll receive a survey. Um, uh, please respond. It helps us keep these things going. And uh, if you have questions or comments, please contact me. And anything else before we sign off here? Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the time to talk to you and. Hope to hear from you later. Thank you so much for putting this on. This was this has been great.